When the Las Vegas Strip reopens, the casino floors may look a little different. We're discussing the future of gaming and hospitality. That's today on Nevada Week. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Cashman Equipment, and additional supporting sponsors. With all hotels and casinos forced to shut down, COVID-19 has devastated the Las Vegas Strip. As we look forward to the eventual reopening, casinos have a chance to reimagine and reinvent the way they operate. Not only will players experience higher cleanliness protocols, but new innovations could be geared to making guests happier and more engaged. To discuss these possible innovations and how they could make casinos more profitable, we are joined by Howard Stutz, Executive Editor of CDC Gaming Reports, Josh Swissman, Founding Partner of the Strategy Organization, and Alan Feldman, Distinguished Fellow in Responsible Gaming at the UNLV International Gaming Institute. But first, everyone wants to know when will casinos get the green light to reopen? We get some insight into how the Gaming Control Board is making reopening decisions with the Chairwoman Sandra Douglas Morgan. Sandra, thank you so much for joining us and being on our show again, especially because you do have a commission meeting later on uh, in this morning, so we particularly appreciate your time here prior to that meeting. Thank you so much for being on the show. Um, I, I wanted to just start off by saying or, or asking, Resorts and casinos are listing reopening dates now in their reopening plans. A lot of those seem to be around late May, early June. I want to ask you, do we have or are we near some form of gaming recommend or opening reopening recommendation that will be provided to the governor? I do believe we're getting near that point, obviously, as, uh, as of today. The phase one reopening has been in place for a couple of weeks. However, the governor will determine when gaming reopens and the board will determine how um, gaming reopens, just like other regulated industries. You know, obviously that is clearly within the governor's um, authority and we um, communicate often and are discussing different developments and obviously information on testing and data and, and information that's been coming from other counties, but he will determine when gaming reopens and the board has been tasked with determining how it will through policies and procedures. Now, the governor has said a couple times that it will be the Gaming Control Board that will make the, the actually give the date. So is he looking for some form of recommendation that's coming through the Control Board or the Commission then? Well, ultimately he will determine the date, but we will um, promulgate guidance for a phased and incremental resumption of a gaming operation. So based on that guidance, he will understand how, when he does determine it, when it's going to be open, how it will be, will be rolled out in phases. Let's talk a little bit about the the uh, the reopening game uh, reopening guidelines here. Uh, you, you know, and I know that on Tuesday you do have a workshop where you are concert, con, uh, consulting a lot of public health officials. Uh, beyond that, who specifically are you consulting, and then what exactly what is the information you are really trying to gather here? Well, sure. We're on um, about May first. The board actually issued an industry guidance that went to all licensees, both restricted, which are fifteen machines or less, and non restricted. 16 or more machines with a race and sports book hotel and things like that about um, a couple of different policies. The one on May 1st was specifically focused on health and safety policies. And I personally consulted with the Southern Nevada Health District, um, Dr. Lagan and his staff there. Um, Mason Van Howling was the CEO of UMC and an infect infectious disease specialist, a uh, physician by the name of Dr. Luis Medina Garcia. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, honestly met them for the first time within the last um, six weeks, and they were kind enough to review our policies and procedures. Also consulted with the Washoe County Health Officer, Kevin Dick. He was kind enough to have a physician on their staff, reviews our policies and procedures as well. You know, the Gaming Control Board, the three of us, we have two attorneys and uh, one very talented gaming, a former gaming executive with an accounting background. So we wanted to make sure that we had information from health experts and infectious disease specialists before issuing um, any type of guidance. So that's who we worked closely with for the health and safety guidance. And we issued it on May 1st, and that was actually the day after um, the governor um, mentioned reopening of phase one, because we wanted to give licensees as much information as possible when we receive it. So they know what would be expected of them when it is actually time to reopen. 
And what specific information are you looking for here? I know the test positivity rate is something that the state is looking at when they're looking at their phased reopening. Is that really a key data point you're looking at? Or are you looking more broadly or more narrow than that? I'm looking at how the state and looking at trending data, healthcare infrastructure, uh, testing, and, and, um, te testing expansion and contact tracing. When they are looking at those numbers, how can we then translate the social distancing requirements, the cleaning and disinfection requirements, um, the testing requirements? How do we translate that to a gaming operation? That is what I see as our role as gaming regulators uh, to be. And so we've taken that guidance. We've taken the, the guidance from medical professionals, clearly from the state and local jurisdictions, and we're able to formulate a policy as to how we can translate that to operations on the now, words like regulatory or restriction sometimes, at least at first glance, might not seem synonymous with words like innovation or invention, but maybe that's not fair. When we're looking at maybe the reopening guidelines specifically as a case study here, how can those guidelines then foster a higher level of innovation or invention? You know, we, we tried not to be very prescriptive, and, and that goes for myself and the other board members. We wanted to say, especially for the larger properties, the, these are our guidelines. You give us your plan as to how you're going to actually comply with these guidelines. And, and keep in mind, you know, the governor's office did create the LEAP committee. That's um, 17 counties led by Clark County Commission Chairwoman uh, Marilyn Kirkpatrick and, of course, Eureka County Chairman um, J.J. Gokachia. And all counties, as you know, in Nevada, we're all very different. And so we set out guidelines and it will be up for the properties to say how they plan on ensuring that people are not sitting next to each other on slot machines. Some may decide to put up plexiglass um, dividers. Some may choose to move stools. Some may want all their machines on because they may have a couple that wants to come and they like the ambiance of the lights. Some may choose to cover bill validators. There, there's a host of other options. And um, we've seen some proposals about using UV lighting to kind of kill bacteria. Uh, people are changing the way their floor is designed. So all of that I think goes to the creativity of this industry. They are one of the most innovative industries, obviously, on the planet. They're constantly reinventing themselves and finding ways to attract new customers and keep their existing customers. And I, um, you know, although this is just such an unfortunate, unfortunate circumstance with COVID and having to close, I know that um, they're definitely going to have a lot of creative ideas when um, when we ultimately do reopen. Now, respect, with respect to the guidelines specifically, you have said that they are fluid. Of course, we are dealing with a lot of uncertainty continued. This has been the theme of COVID-19 all the way through. That uncertainty isn't going away anytime soon, experts are telling us. Can you define what, when we're talking about specific regulations here and restrictions, what does fluidity mean? I don't think anyone wants to use the word fluid when we're talking about regulation, um, but we, we've issued industry notices because that give us, gives us the flexibility to give clarity on guidance that has already been issued. So these industry notices are um, as a result of the governor's emergency directive, giving the board the ability to enforce and create guidelines um, with regard to the COVID response. It is, it, it, I would only use the term fluid because we're still learning more about the virus we're still tracking that information. Um, you know, everything, even though it seems like it's been an incredibly long time, we actually closed in March, which is a long time, but not a very long time to learn about how this virus um, works, whether or not we're on the path to getting uh, medicine to kind of suppress some of the symptoms or even a vaccine. So we know, we know and we all hope that that is coming in the future. So as information changes, as we get more information about contact tracing and that ability to expand, as hopefully we'll hear, what you'll hear on Tuesday is the ability for um, testing expansion, both in um, Clark County and in Washoe County. As we get more information and as those other categories of the state have outlined, gets in a more um, positive trend, those regulations or the industry notices and the guidances that we've issued um, may also follow suit. And would that then lead to a change in restrictions? I mean, could we see uh, opening up of what some of the restrictions are right now? Yeah, for example, you know, when um, gaming does reopen, we were pretty clear that we needed to have a 50% occupancy because that would be needed to achieve the social distancing requirements. Um, also, just to show that, you know, we don't have 50%, more than 50% of your slots going at one time. Those things may change. Obviously, the um, non-gaming amenities that are on gaming properties, those are going to be subjected also to the county restrictions whether it be for restaurants and hotels and spas. And so as those other non-gaming amenities are able to reopen under the um, state restrictions and the, the county restrictions, which, which may be more stringent, um, those obviously may change as we learn more about the virus and hopefully as things improve.
Chairwoman Douglas Morgan broke down the role of the Gaming Control Board in the casino's reopening. Now our panel looks forward to what guests should expect when doors reopen. Well, the world has changed and Vegas is changing with it. That's what a new Vegas ad says with a new slogan, a new Vegas for a new reality. Let's let that sink in for a second of just how different that messaging is to messaging that we have seen in Las Vegas and across Nevada. Uh, Howard, I want to start with you. This is also maybe a big sign that although our casino doors are maybe still closed, the doors for more reinvention and reimagination of things like our branding and messaging are very much open. And I want to ask you on the gaming side of this, are you seeing a lot of opportunity for reinvention and reimagination already? Yeah, I think there has to be at some point here with the way, um, you know, we, we don't know what the, what the reopening is going to look like with customers coming in, what people want. It's going to be a challenge, I, I, I got kind of almost like as a play as you go here uh, for, the, for the operators to try to figure out what works, what doesn't. I think we've seen more technology. Now we're going to see technology this simple as uh, with use of the mobile phone, uh, of app, you know, virtual check-ins where you don't have to, you know, go into the property, you know, to be at the front at the lobby to check into the hotel or, or a restaurant, you'll get a notice to go to the table. I think we're going to see a little more of that um, as we as we move along. But, you know, in terms of other gaming opportunities, you know, I think hope I think at some point Nevada will look at online gaming, full on online gaming, not just online poker is like, like we have now. So maybe that'll be a change that we'll see down the road. It's not gonna happen right away. There's too much going on that they need to address. Right. Josh, as, as uh, Howard mentioned, we do have mobile technology now that is allowing a little bit less touch. Um, MGM is implementing some of that already. They've had that in the reopening plans. Do you see a lot more doors opening for mobile technology or other technology that can be placed on the hospitality end of this? For sure. Mobile mobile technology, I think, moves to the forefront here, and that's for a few different reasons. One, as Howard said, it facilitates touchless interactions, which I think is going to be important. So I think as you move on to the gaming floor, I think cashless interactions and touchless interactions um, will become the norm in the future. Uh, you know, you might see that video poker button deck being recreated on your mobile device. Um, I also think it becomes pretty important from a marketing and messaging front and that is due in large part to the to the huge technology adoption curve that we've all been experiencing during this pandemic and, and particularly during the shutdown. I think we've all had uh, our Zoom calls with uh, you know our parents, our children, our grandchildren, and people are, are video conferencing that uh, never did before. People are ordering uh, food service delivery from their mobile apps. And so that familiarity with uh, the mobile device and and just the, the the additional reliance on the mobile device for day to day interactions, I think pushes the the opportunity to send more targeted real time messaging through mobile apps uh, as well for 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 casinos. Alan, let's talk a little bit about problem gaming here. More access virtually could potentially mean more access for problem gamers as well. Is that a big concern? Well, it certainly is a concern for problem gamblers because the more access they have, uh, the greater likelihood that they're going to get into, into trouble. Having said that, the whole notion of cashless uh, technology also provides some safeguards that have never really existed before. Mm -hmm. So there's both benefit and concern that comes into play there, uh, as well as for, for everyone else, for the rest of the public, there are also some wonderful new safeguards that come along with that cashless technology. Uh, we've all got to understand it, and we all have to understand how it fits in to a casino environment, how consumers can access it uh, easily and quickly, and how uh, the, the operators themselves can manage it. But I do think that this is, a, in the end, a really important opportunity for everyone. Can you give us some more specific on what some of those safeguards would be that could potentially be used in a cashless environment versus a, a cash environment? Well, the simplest one would be to think about limit setting. Um, right now, if, if, you, uh, if you go to use your ATM card, the only limit that you've got is whatever the bank itself sets on your account. If you, if you look at the way in which cashless systems work, they're, they're funneling through common uh, clearinghouses. And if, if in fact you can access 
those clearinghouses for limit setting, now you, you're really creating a safety net, not just for problem gamblers, you're creating a safety net that anyone can access. And I'd also add to that, additionally, uh, we do struggle across the country. Certain states have self-exclusion lists, uh, Massachusetts, Michigan, Maryland, et cetera. But that doesn't apply when you go to other states, including Nevada. With the advent of a, of a national uh, ability to self-exclude through the cashless systems, now you have a national self-exclusion list. And that, again, increases consumer protection, doesn't decrease it. Great, great point. One of the, Howard, hey, Kip, yeah, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I was Howard, just going to no, add Howard, to go Alan. What he, what he mentioned is, you know, a lot of these casinos, a lot of the talk in technology has been the cashless gaming, cash, the wallet, mobile wallets used for, for, for gambling. The problem, uh, responsible gaming has to be a part of this as these, as these casinos and gaming companies, uh, tech companies develop these mobile wallets. I think that's going to be an important step that, and, and to pack, add on to what Alan just said. Josh, to take a sidestep away from some of the tech advancements here, let's look at something that has been tried and true, a tradition of Las Vegas and Nevada's hospitality, and that is guest interactions here. Do you think there is potentially a lot of innovation that could happen given some of the restrictions we have on guests and social distancing right now? Sure. Um, procedurally and from a protocol standpoint, uh, the, the whole industry, and in particular uh, Nevada and Las Vegas, have to be innovative in terms of their approach to guest service. But this one, I, I take a more old school approach. This, you know, people are gonna be coming back into these buildings with a high level of uncertainty. Uh, you know, it'll be the first time in months that um, many of them will, will be there. And I think we go back to old school guest service. And I promise you that uh, no matter how many masks you're wearing, if you deliver great guest service with a smile behind that mask, the guest will be able to feel that. And I think that is truly what is going to lead the way through this next phase in our industry uh, from a guest service standpoint. Howard, the, the, the tactile feeling of chips, if we got away from that and we don't have gaming chips um, on a gaming floor, things like that that are more old school tradition, are there concerns that maybe how gaming is uh, conducted on a gaming floor could potentially <clears throat> change and change for forever? Well, I saw this uh, last summer, we went to uh, after my daughter graduated law school, we all went to Barcelona for a vacation or a celebration. And we went out to a casino in Barcelona and the blackjack table almost, there weren't chips, there were virtual chips. It was almost like an iPad embedded into the, uh, into the table. So we've seen some, so we've seen this in other markets, you know, other countries. It could be an advancement coming here. I mean, it's just, I walk into the, I used to cover, you know, I used to cover the World Series of Poker. The only sound you hear is everybody fuddling with their chips. You know that sound of the chips uh, being played with, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as poker players do do so. Um, I, it's going to be a a lot of change we're going through. I think, as what Josh said, you know, the masks. You know, custom, uh, employees. A lot of the casinos we're seeing now in their reopening plans are saying that they're going to require their workers to wear, you know, face masks. I think that's a good thing. I think that's going to make a comfort thing for customers. They're they're going to suggest it to customers to wear masks and we're going to see a lot of customers doing that. I think that's kind of a, the, it's terms of this, you know, the old school making your customer feel, feel uh, good in the, in the property. I think that's part of it. And I think that's what we're going to see is this, as we go along, as we, you know, whenever this reopening takes place here, we're seeing that in reopenings in California and Arizona right now. And Louisiana opened on, um, um, on Monday and Mississippi on Thursday. We're seeing that we're, we're you know, Employees are wearing masks, customers are wearing masks. It's, it's just the way it, it's kind of the, the, the way it is right now. Yeah, Alan, I, that, I that is, think, though, that, uh, please, oh, Josh, go ahead. I, I do think there is, a, there is an interesting place for technology in this discussion, though, when you talk about um, automated check-in features and even some automation around food and beverage. I think that those perhaps less well-received technology innovations up to this point become much more uh, well received and, and become an important part of the process going forward as well. So it really is that combination of guest service with solid uh, technology and automation where appropriate. Yep. Alan, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the constant theme of COVID-19, which is this level of uncertainty. There is really nothing to say that this uncertainty is going to go away. And that is why we are, have such a big challenge on being able to um, make maybe long-term or short-term decisions here on what makes the most sense. I wanted to ask you specifically, when we're talking about innovation here, 
does the level of uncertainty restrict or promote levels of innovation? Well, I think it definitely promotes it. I, I think we've seen the innovative side of this business kick into, you know, turbocharge. It, it's been amazing. Um, I think that there are ideas that have been out there for some time, either didn't have the funding or maybe, you know, didn't have people who were willing to put things uh, into the market, who were willing to change out things to, you know, to Howard's point, uh, you know, will anyone ever get over touching all those chips? Well, you know, I'm reminded of a couple of things, both in the industry and outside. Uh, outside of the industry, will anyone ever get over touching a newspaper? How could anyone read a newspaper without touching that, that newsprint and actually feeling the paper? Well, we know that's not true. Uh, will anyone ever get over the experience of not going to a movie theater? Who on earth would ever want to watch a movie in their home? How ridiculous. That's not true. Will customers ever not want to put coins into slot machines and, and get those coins out, that feeling of hearing the coins hit the tray and then carrying around those buckets, that's not true. I think we're going to find that a lot of these things that we hold on to as traditions, while they are fun and while people enjoy them at this moment in time, they're absolutely willing to abandon for health reasons. And I suspect that once they get used to the newer technology, including the, the kind of technology that Howard's talking about, of virtual chips, they're going to be perfectly fine with that. They're going, to, they're going to accommodate to that very quickly. And I think that the innovation in the industry is going to help facilitate that. Howard, Alan says it's going to promote, uh, the uncertainty promotes a lot more innovation. Do you, do you agree with that? I agree, and Alan's right. There's, there are a lot of ideas that have come up. I mean, like, you said, like you said, funding, you know, just, you know, the, you know, basic process, getting them into play. Yeah, I think we'll see that. It, it's right. People adapt. I mean, when you talk about virtual chips, social gaming on your mobile phone where you're just playing for, for virtual tokens, you know, it just, hmm. it's a way the casino companies connecting with their customers when they're not at the properties. Uh, we're going to see more of that. You know, they're used to virtual tokens. Um, I think we'll, you know, you, I remember when, uh, when, uh, as a, uh, slot machines stopped taking coins where you just, you know, was ticking in, ticking out. Some of the companies actually put in the sound of the coins dropping as a, as a part of the, as part of the activity. We may see that. We'll have to pipe in the sound of chips being played around. I mean, I think, well, there, there's ways to get around it and people adapt, and especially in this environment now, we've all had to adapt. I mean, look, look where I'm doing this interview from, you know, from my, I've done more interviews from my, my home office than, than ever before. I mean, you just, this is what, this is how we adapt now. And this is what, and we're, and we're going to adapt more. And I think casino customers, because they want to go back into the properties, they want a sense of normalcy and going back, that's what we're seeing. Um, that's what they'll adapt to when new technology comes along. Josh, adaptation, of course, a big part of discovery and innovation. Um, in other fields, transparency and collaboration are key in addition to a healthy dose of competition, usually advanced discovery and invention here. Do you see us having the right mix here? We have quite a bit of competition on the strip, of course. Um, do you think we do have that transparency, collaboration and competition mix uh, to be able to really move forward innovation here? I think um, going forward, we'll certainly have more of that transparency. All, all you need to look at right now to, to understand that people are willing to communicate more to uh, competitors and, and, and to the industry at large is what um, we have done on the strip with all of our cleaning and sanitation protocols uh, with, with Wynn Resorts leading the way there, publishing their document, uh, being the first one to do so, and others following suit throughout uh, the rest of the the, the city and state and around the country. So I hope that that is a, a beacon of what's to come. Uh, I think from a, look from an academic standpoint, we have an amazing infrastructure in in this city, and um, I think those two things coupled together, uh, along with um, something else that that we're not talking much about yet, and that is with all of this technology innovation that we've discussed so far comes an amazing wealth of underlying data that is going to allow us to be so much smarter about future innovation and how to communicate to customers and what customers want. I think those three things together become a, a great recipe for a collaborative, more transparent, still very competitive, um, innovative environment.
Alan, we're almost out of time. We got about a minute. I, I want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, let's talk about the academia side here. Um, UNLV International Gaming Institute, Center for Gaming Inno Innovation, Hospital and Esports Innovation Lab, Blackfire Innovation, Caesars and UNLV Partnership, a lot going on here. Are we still and will we always be the hub, even though we see casinos already opening um, internationally and domestically, is everybody still going to be looking to us to see how we are going to do this over the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, I think the short answer there is yes. And actually, you left out one other center, and that's the Center for Regulatory uh, Studies led by Joe Bertoloni. And I want to highlight that one in particular right now because so much hinges on regulatory approvals during this time. All this innovation is great, but now you've got to get it into the field. And Joe has been leading uh, discussions with, with regulators from some of the largest jurisdictions around the world. Just as the industry needs to innovate, so too does the regulatory community. And hopefully this is going to create some streamlining within the regulatory community so that we can begin to see products come to market and get into the marketplace much more quickly and across different jurisdictions much more efficiently than we have in the past. And that's one of the things that I know that Joe and his team at the Regulatory Center at UNLV have been working on. Well, thank you so much. We're out of time. We really appreciate all of the, uh, the background and the experience that you have provided. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Nevada Week. To find all the resources that we've discussed on the show, please visit our website at vegaspbs.org slash Nevada week. You can also find us on social media at Nevada Week.